So we're going to do a full example now of the Carnot map process. This is a, you know, from plain language description of the problem uh, to a complete solution with circuits. Uh, this problem is in the third set of notes, the, the sequential devices notes. Uh, and these notes, we're going to have a full uh, YouTube video series on a little later uh, that will describe some clever and interesting devices we're going to need for building out our computers in the first place. So we are, uh, first though, we're going to show an example of the full process. It's a little bit of a contrived example because it's mathematical, and it's nice to have examples that are more real world than that. Uh, the Mano textbook has a few nice examples of uh, driving the lights of a car or a security system, stuff like that, where there's a few inputs and a few outputs. Uh, but this is a nice example because it has all of the features. It has uh, four inputs, it has multiple outputs, it has don't cares, it's pretty good. So the intent for this example is we're going to design a circuit that will take a binary coded decimal number and convert it to XS3. Now, what are binary coded decimal and XS3? Well, we can look at these and I can show you uh, what they work with. Uh, so a binary coded decimal is a decimal number that's encoded in four bits of binary. Why this is interesting is that it starts at zero and ends at nine and none of the other input combinations are relevant. So you can't have 10, 11, or 12 in a binary coded decimal because those are not single digits of decimal numbers. So we throw away 10 through 15 and that's where our don't cares are going to come from because we don't see 10 through 15. They will never occur. And so we don't care what the output is for any particular result. Uh, XS3 is uh, binary coded decimal, and then we just add three to it. We call this a balanced code uh, because it starts at 0011 and ends at 1100. There are good reasons to use this. It's a bit of a precursor to some of the um, coding, some of the encoding techniques we're going to use for floating point numbers later on in the course. Um, uh, it's a biased representation, biased balanced representation. And so what we're going to do is just basically take this number uh, from 0 to 9 and add 3 to it. We're going to get um, 0 is represented as 0011 and 9 is represented as 1100. It's, it can be a bit confusing because 1100 is not 9. It is uh, not 8 plus 4 is 12. Uh, but we're going to use this as our representation for 9 because there are some advantages to it. Don't worry too much about it. It's Like I say, it's a bit of a contrivance, but it's a nice complete example. So if we're going to uh, say, first of all, that our whole process involves starting from the description, then we're going to uh, investigate the problem and sketch out our plan for the number of inputs, the number of outputs, how those inputs and outputs are going to be labeled, uh, and how we're going to represent them. So first of all, we're going to say, those four inputs need to be related to each other, so it's not a bad idea to give them a relational kind of a numbering system. So instead of A, B, C, D, or, or W, X, Y, Z, we're going to call it B3, B2, B1, and B0 for our binary coded decimal numbers. And then our outputs are going to be E3, E2, E1, and E0. Four inputs, four outputs. This means that there are going to be four separate four input circuits, one for each of these outputs. Because it, the whole machine is going to be operating together, and these will always depend on the same inputs, um, there may be some efficiencies to be had, which we can look at later. But the basic design principle is to build from scratch each circuit, one for each of these outputs. So I just worked up the truth table for you. <clears throat> this is, again, a big part of the process is to think about for each possible input combination, what the output combination is going to be. Now, I like I say, I sort of short-circuited it for you because it makes the example a little bit quicker. Uh, but what we can see is uh, the decimal number zero, or this should be binary coded decimal zero, is, um, has an output of E3 is zero, the output of E2 is zero, the output of E1 is one, and the output of E0 is one, making a uh, combined output of the XS3 number zero, which looks like the number three in our regular binary. One becomes four, two becomes five, three becomes six, etc. And then from nine becomes 12, 10 doesn't matter. All the way up to 15 doesn't matter. We will never see these inputs because they're not, they don't belong to the binary coded decimal encoding. And so we'll never see them. And so we can treat them as don't care conditions. So this is, and I hope this makes sense, the truth table that I'm providing for you. The next part then is to take from this truth table each one of these input combinations, oh, sorry, each one of these output um, functions and create a Carnot map for each one of these. 
Here are some of the examples of the Carnot maps. So again, what I'm doing is I'm taking, for example, if I'm looking at E3, I'm going from here down, and I'm saying it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, X, 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 X. Those are the eight, uh, sorry, the 16 outputs for those input combinations. And then we're going to drop them into the K map. Now, it's important to recognize the order in which we drop them in terms into the K map, because the ordering here matters, right? We flip these outputs. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, down here for 8, 1, 0, 0, 0 is 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So that ordering matters. And again, the more practice you get, the more you'll get the feeling for, take the numbers in the K-map, or in the truth table, and drop them into the K-map just by reading them off, right? We got 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. And I like to break these up into pieces um, because this is the first row. These four are the first row. These four are the second row. These four are the third row. And these four are the fourth row. Because again, we're doing the flipping. Um, yeah, good enough. So here, it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 0. That's these. 0, 0, and then that one and that one. And here, it's 0, 1, 1, 1. 0, 1, 1, and 1. 1, 1, 1, x. 1, 1, sorry, yeah, 1, 1, x and x. And then the last one is x, 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 x. And don't forget, again, I'm going to keep reminding you because those two get flipped. That's the most common problem with K-maps is forgetting to flip those rows or those columns. So it's worth practicing that part. So anyway, now we've got zeros in the first few rows and we've got ones here and don't cares. And remember the idea with don't cares is we can include them or not based on what makes the biggest prime implicants. So here we've got these prime implicants. These two ones can be grouped with all of these big X's, and that gives us the term B3. B3 is true, this whole group, so that's just B3. These two ones can be grouped with these two X's, these two ones can be grouped with these two X's, and that gives us the groups B2, B1, that's this one, right? B2, B1 is here, and then B2, B0, this one here, B2, B0. So that's the solution for the first term, for the first output. Then again, here we start with E2, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, x, 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 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, x, 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 x. Okay, so copying from the truth table into the Carnot map, I hope makes sense. You can follow that again. Then again, we're going to group. This one can be grouped with an x. These ones here can be grouped together, including this one, x. These ones here can be grouped together, including those two x's. And so these don't care conditions for this group, for the second output, these don't care terms are included differently, right? These ones will become zero and this one will become a one. The x's that are in a group become a one and the x's that are not in a group become a zero. They don't stay as don't cares because when you have an input happening in a circuit, there will be an output. Uh, but if we don't care what the output is, then we put an X there and it could be one or zero based on what would simplify best. So then again, we group these together and then we read the group off of the K map. This is B2, B1 prime, B0 prime. That's this one. This one here is uh, B2 prime, right? And then this is B1. That's this one. And then this one here, the group is here. It is B2 prime again and B0. Now we have to do two more because we have four outputs to solve. We have to solve them each separately. So we do two more. They look like this. Uh, B1 prime, B0 prime here. And again, we can look at the truth table and see 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, x, 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 x. And the same one here. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, x, 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 x. And then... This one looks like this, and we can collect them together, B1 prime, B0 prime, and this is B1, B0. And again, like we talked about in class, you can recognize that this is actually a exclusive NOR pattern. I'll talk about those patterns in just a second. And then here, uh, it's these X's included, these ones not included. The whole group is just single term B0 prime. Uh, which makes sense, because if you start with an even number and you get an odd number, 
that should flip the last bit. If you start with an odd number and get an even number, that should flip the last bit. And that's what we do, right? If we look at the way that this is encoded, if we're adding three, then an even number will become an odd number, and an odd number will become an even number. And so we could, even just by looking at it, say that last bit is gonna change no matter what happens, which means that last bit just flips. So that works okay. Then we can take these terms, these four circuits, right? One, two, three, four, that we solved for, and we can now draw circuits for each of these. So each of these, E3 is B3 or B2B1 or B2B0, and recognizing that this B1 or B0 is common between E3 and E2, we can factor that out. There's a reason we do this, right? This looks like we're moving away from the minimum uh, two-level design, which we are a little bit, but it's an efficiency. We can recognize, if we recognize that there are terms that are common between groups in the same circuit, then even though they're separate circuits, because they're happening together in a group, the inputs are a group, the outputs are a group, we can make efficiencies between them. And so if we um, use distributive to factor this B2 out of this and the B2 prime out of this, it will save us one gate because we don't have to calculate B1 or B0 twice. So that happens here. We do B1 or B0. We use that twice here and here. And then we can uh, generate the rest of the circuit. E0 is easy. It's just inverting B0. Done. E1 is easy. It's just an exclusive NOR on B1 and B0. Done. E2 is a little bit more work. It's B2, B1 prime, B0 prime. So this is B2, B1 prime, B0 prime. Right? And B0 prime is already available here. We don't have to invert B0 twice. We can use that there. And then B2 prime... Uh, which is here, B2 prime, uh, right here, sorry, B2 prime, anded with this OR combination of B1 and B0. And then the same thing happens here. Uh, this is B3, anded with the OR combination of B1 and B0. Okay, uh, uh, sorry, B2, that's right, because it's B2, ended with B1 or B0, here's B1 or B0, here's B2, and then B3 comes along and is ORed with that, and the end result is E3. So now we have four outputs and four inputs, and this is a complete um, result, starting from the basic description of the problem all the way down to the full circuit.